turning red. It's on. We're moving. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that doesn't take me out of the frame. Um, and Hazel Arthur is going to lead an opening prayer for us. Um, thank you very much. Ready? Yeah. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for all the ways that you bless us and provide for us. Thank you for your grace. And thank you for your word, which um, gives us guidance on how to live and help us to uh, follow scripture. Help us to hide the word in our heart so that we won't sin against you. Thank you for this class and every lady here. Thank you for their families. Help each one of us to um, glean from the lessons, ways to be mindful of our thoughts, to take those captive, to make them obedient to Christ. Help us to serve you in a mighty way and help us to be ready when you return so that we can join you for eternity. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Um, so as a quick um, recap from last week, because last week was really just the introduction. Um, we, I went over what, as I see it, the three overall learning objectives of the class are. Um, and now I'm going to have to, no, I don't have to remember them from memory. They're right here, but I've been thinking about them for a while. We want to um, examine Paul's example, as we see it in Philippians, of intentional thinking and draw some conclusions for our own lives. Um, Obviously, we are identifying that our thought patterns matter because we're spending this much time thinking about it. But because they matter, realizing we have a choice in what we think. We are not a victim to our thoughts. Um, we get to choose that. And um, I don't know why I can't read my own writing. Um, because we're Christians, or if you are trying to follow the Bible and haven't yet made the decision to commit your life to Christ, Part of being a Christian is learning how to have the mind of Christ. And um, the Bible tells us that we're supposed to compare our thoughts and make our thoughts align with the mind of Christ. And so um, one of the verses that I mentioned last week was the one in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, um, about taking every thought captive. And I probably did something like this because I need a good hand motion <laughs> to help me remember, like, no, come back here. Um, thought and so and that our overall goal is not just oh I kind of want to improve I want to get a little better the goal is transforming our thought patterns um, so that's really what we're working towards is that idea of transforming our thought patterns not just it, of course that starts by getting a little bit better and a little bit better each day but with that ultimate goal of really transforming our thoughts um, one of the exercises that we did last week is I had everybody write down just the thoughts that were that were in their mind that day or while we were sitting in class and write them on post-it notes. And everybody came up here and we actually, I moved that, but they stuck them on this whiteboard. So I took them home and categorized them. And not that this is a huge point in class, but I just thought it was interesting to see what we were all thinking of and what the the thickest um, stacks were. So well-being and health was a pretty big category. Um, family, friends, and relationships was probably the biggest category of just things that, and they, these weren't all necessarily things, I don't know if people were worried about them, it was just things you're thinking about. Um, so that was one big category. Work was a large, a large stack. Um, and I just made up the names of these categories. They're not scientifically like valid or anything. Um, I called this one to-do list and domestic tasks. Um, a lot of us were thinking about dinner and laundry um, and home repair. Um, we had a really nice stack of spiritual thoughts, so way to go. This is Bible class. Um, there were plenty of people with that. World issues. I mean, domestic tasks, the laundry, but we're also worried about the issues affecting today's American woman. So that was a nice stack. Um, we had a really, I was really glad to see there was fun and exciting stuff. So hobbies, upcoming vacations were things that were taking up people's minds. 
I separated out children and grandchildren. I felt like they were their own category outside of um, family, friends, and relationships. There were a, just a lot of things about children and grandchildren in our lives. Um, let's see. Not the biggest stack. Worries and uncertainties was one category. Um, and then, yes, dogs needed their own category <laughs> as well. Um, I, now, I could have just done an animals category, but I don't want to get lost in the weeds here. But there were things about coyotes, rats, mice. What's that in my attic scratching around? Like, things like that. So I could have just done an animal category. Any but skunks? <laughs> do what? No Any skunks. No skunks. I'm traumatized. Let's not think about skunks. But if you ever get skunked at your house, call me and I will help you. Um, we'll keep through it. And then um, this last one could not be categorized. It was just truly random stuff that I was like, I have no idea where to put lip gloss. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should put it with world issues. <laughs> the things, there's the coyote. Um, the things affecting today's American woman, lip gloss. Um, I mean, you can control that. So anyway, just interesting of what we were all thinking about last week. Um, if we, I would really love to do that every single week, but I, don't worry, I won't make you do that. But there is some value in just putting what's on your mind, whether it's a list or things, when I say intrusive thoughts, I don't necessarily mean negative ones, but are you ever sitting in a class, in a meeting, in a conversation with somebody, and all of a sudden you're like, oh my goodness, I've got to remember to get a face wash at a Target. <laughs> and like, or something like that, or oh, what if I don't thaw out the chicken, which that just hit me. I did not thought the chicken before I left the house to come here. But stuff like that, those thoughts that just pop into your head, writing them down can be a really nice way to pull them out. Who is it? Isn't it Dumbledore who does that in Harry Potter? It puts the wand up and pulls the thought out of his head. Writing it down, is it? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. I wish I could do that like physically. But writing it down is about as close as you can get. So if your head's feeling really, really full, sometimes that's a nice thing to do is just sit down and write it all out, get it out. But we won't do that every single week. Um, so that was a recap of last week. This week, um, I've got a few key points. I will not call them learning objectives, but key points for this week. Um, I wrote them out so nicely. I printed them, and then I left them on my printer at home. So um, I'm going to be reading them off with my phone here, but I did write them down. Um, if you don't get them all written down because I talk, a little fast, don't worry about it, they're going to be in the email. So you can just see them in the email too. Um, so first, we're going to talk about the devil. I mean, let's just call him who he is. Satan is our enemy, father of lies, he's got all these other names, and daily he tries to attack our minds. Um, and that's just in the last few years, I think I've really let myself kind of feel that scary feeling, but also that reality of He's real, and he's he's not just going to pop up as the little cartoon <laughs> red devil, or when I was a kid, my mom would always give me all these circumstances of the bad people, you know, who were going to come offer me drugs or <laughs> offer me, does anybody, ever, did anybody ever get warned about Mickey Mouse tattoos that were really drugs that were going to seep into your skin? <laughs> Nobody? Just rural Alabama? <laughs> Come on, Caitlin. Surely that, that is... Alabama didn't do that. That didn't go around. Oh, no, there, were, there were photocopies. Kids, do not take this tattoo and rub it on you because if you lick it, you're going to get high or something. Anyway, there were all these warnings of these bad people. So I feel like we notice... We notice like true evil, we notice something that really just stands out as a contrast, but what we don't notice are those little shots, those little jabs, those little attacks on our minds daily that come in through really innocent places. Um, media is a huge place where they come in, um, conversations, watching other people and what they're doing. but. That Satan is going to attack our minds and try to chip away at them and chip away at us trying to focus on Jesus daily. Um, if you want a real, I don't know how many of you love to read fiction, but, um, and Kathy Richter is teaching next week, and she went ahead and let me see some of the things she's going to cover. 
So she's got a book she's actually going to talk about, but one book that is a really wonderful illustration in a fictional setting of this mental warfare that goes on daily. And I don't know if you'll guess it or not. It's a children's book, A Wrinkle in Time. Don't watch the movie. Um, read the book. Have any of you read that book as an adult? Have you read it? Madeline Lingle wrote, she was probably one of the most prolific writers who was in it, that, who professed to be a Christian. <coughs> most people think of C.S. Lewis, but Madeline Lingle probably wrote just as much, as, if not more. And A Wrinkle in Time is full of spiritual messages, and it's all about the fight for your mind and not to let, um, I think it's called It in the book. It's been a few years, but it's about not letting it control your mind and about thinking for yourself. And in this case, we're talking about making ourselves choose to have the mind of Christ. But it's a really eye-opening book when you think about it in that spiritual context. Um, but we're not studying a wrinkle in time. I just wanted to put it out there because it's such it's such a great story. But it's I think as an adult reading it, you could really pull out those spiritual themes um, and go, whoa, that's yeah, that's pretty real. That's happening. Um, so our enemy, Satan. Oh, it doesn't know my face from over here. Get my notes back out. Um, is trying to attack our minds daily. And that's probably one of the hardest battles many of us will ever fight in our lifetime. It's just that battle between our ears. I may have even said that last week, but just trying to make it personal. It's not something that other people fight. We all fight it. And if we don't recognize that we're having to fight for our minds, then that might be a little um, recognition too. Okay, let me, let me see what's, what's rolling around in my head. Um, Proverbs, there are lots of verses, so I'm not going to be exhaustive in all the parts of the Bible that talk about this, but Proverbs 23, 7 is very specific, and um, it talks about how we think, that's how we are. Um, let's see. Okay, so I studied psychology in school and child development, and then it was really interesting to see that referenced in this book that we're pulling from also for class. And so all these lies that we hear from Satan, there's this um, it's pretty basic psychology, to uh, I can't even think of the word, I guess topic in psychology, that all the negative thoughts that are in a human mind come from about three basic roots. Um, one of them is I'm worthless. Um, one of them is I'm unlovable. And the other one is I'm helpless victim and when you just boil it down to those three the things that worry us that nag us that that are really lies that are completely contrary to what the bible tells us it tells us we're we're human we're not perfect we're not divine but we are loved we we're not helpless when we're connected to christ and we have worth or god wouldn't have sent his only son to die for us if we were worthless. Um, and so think about, there's something else to think about. If you ever hear some version of that message in your head, tell that voice in your head, that's, wait, no, that's a lie. That's not what God tells us. Um, my favorite verse in the whole Bible that really sums up, that really refutes all three of those lies is 2 Timothy 1.7. Um, can somebody look that one up really quick? I think I know it by heart. Yeah. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power and love and sound mind. That's right. I love that verse. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And that's exactly what we're talking about in here is he gave us a mind to think. We're not a slave to our mind. Um, so... Um, we talked about having a choice, and that was one of the big main points. So one thing that we're going to do quickly, let me see what time it is. Oh, we're good on time. Um, one of the handouts that you have is, and y'all, I'm a word person. I may have mentioned this last week, too. Formatting, making things all beautiful, layout. It's not my gift. Um, but words, I'm okay with words and thoughts. So one of your sheets is just a list of questions. And so I want us to take just about five minutes. I'm not going to sit and stare at you. Um, and with the person next to you, or if you're sitting on your own, turn around to the two behind you. 
and go through those questions. If you didn't get to read Philippians 1 or listen to Philippians 1 this week, that's okay. The goal is not that you fill in every single blank spot, but just a quick conversation with the questions that are on there. Don't everybody start at once. <laughs> <laughs>
messages and images coming at us all the time but just remembering that is where he is in Philippians and then make it personal real fast so what are my circumstances am I literally chained up right now nobody is if that is your situation at home you need to tell somebody haha <laughs> um, <laughs> but you really need to tell somebody <laughs> that um, for real safe place probably a lot of safe places in here um, but so think about our circumstances. Would our leap to jumping to, let me just quick think of a few things I'm grateful for. Let me quick think of some things that I can count on that are not uncertain. That will start flipping that switch in our brains to not go down the spiral. 
And you got the spiral handout, mm -hmm. so I'm going to move to that too because I, yeah, I see the clock. I would keep looking for it back there. Um, so this idea of I have a choice. So you've got two spiral handouts. One is the I have a choice. I just made up the names of these. But Jenny Allen, who wrote this book, if you want to learn more about, she really breaks down these thought spirals. And in the coming weeks, we're going to be um, talking about the different attacks that the enemy uses on us um, and what weapons or what tools. Um, Cindy, that was something she said last week was she was really, she's like, I'm hoping we learn some tools to really combat um, unhealthy thought patterns. And so that's what we're going to start talking about in the coming weeks or what are those specific um, things that Satan uses to, to infiltrate our thoughts. And then what are the tools, what are the weapons that we have available in Christ to combat those specific things. So I want to jump ahead of that, but I'm not going to. Um, but what I want to introduce tonight is this idea of how our emotions and our feelings connect ultimately to our behaviors and our outlooks. I do have some Bible verses for you here, so if you want to write these down to look up later. Um, Let's see. Let me make sure I haven't jumped ahead of myself. That happens quite a bit. Get the cart before the horse all the time. Um, one idea that um, that I talked about last week when we listed our thoughts um, in all this big stack here. And remember, there's the many ones that are stuck in here, too. That whatever we're fixated on, not just what we're randomly thinking on, but what we're fixated on, what's taking up our mind and what we're dwelling on, could be really revealing of what we're living for. And as people following Jesus, we really just have one purpose. And there's a lot of ways to say it. So somebody tell me what to you as a Christian is our one purpose? Why are we here? What's the meaning of life? To show sure others the way. Glorify God. Live God and, and love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. There's several verses that, or several passages in the Bible that put it together, but it's to point to God to sh by sharing the gospel. That has to do with our relationships with people, and it has to do with our relationship with God. And um, so, a few verses that you can look up again, not, not an exhaustive list, but I mean, that's really, that gospel means good news. That's really good news to me if I ultimately have one job. I mean, just one job. <laughs> My calendar has things all over the place, and I feel all these different things pulling on me, different roles in my life. But ultimately, I have one job. And to me, that is really good news, that if I can make everything in my life connect, feed into that one job, then, then I'm doing something right. So a few verses where you can um, see that articulated. And I encourage you, look up other verses that connect to these. Um, Matthew 22, 37 through 40, um, it's one of the parables. Um, Acts 20, 24, and Mark 4, 35 through 40, that's the one that's one of the parables, my bad, not Matthew. I didn't get them in the correct order. Um, what was Mark? Can you repeat? Mark, sure, I do talk too fast. Matthew 22, 37 through 40, Acts 20, 24. And that one was kind of hidden for me, but it says at the end of Acts 20, 24, like, this is the task God has given us, which is pretty pretty direct. And then Mark 4, 35 through 40, that's right after um, the parable of the sower and the soil, which is one of my favorite parables, but it's when Jesus is on the boat with his disciples right after he's just done all this incredible groundbreaking teaching. And they go out on the boat, and it gets real stormy, and they're all scared to death. And he looks at them lovingly, but he calls them on it, and he's like, y'all, I mean, I'm paraphrasing here. Y'all, I just showed you who I was, and then you're still scared, and I'm right here with you. Um, and he really points it out to them really specifically there. Um, so I want to move on really quickly to addressing this idea of how what we feel directly connects to our thoughts. And thankfully, because I was able to see Kathy's notes from next week, I'm going to be able to keep it within our time frame tonight because she's going to keep on talking about that. She's got some really good quotes, some additional scriptures that are going to continue on that theme and then connect us directly to, so 
so what tools do I have, what weapons do I have available to me as a Christian to fight Satan's attacks on my mind? This phone's not stayed lit up long enough for me. Um, so we're expected as Christians to make that intentional choice. When we were having our little small group just then, I said, I am... I have to pray to establish my mind, like set my mind. This is how I'm going to think today, no matter what, because I can't control what's going to be coming at me necessarily, but I can control my response to it and my attitude. And the Bible tells us we're supposed to establish our hearts, and if we're focused on our one purpose, that can really help us go in that direction of setting ourselves where we need to be thinking. Um, so a few verses that really reflect and spoiler, some of these were the suggested memory verses last week um, that can help us choose to align our thoughts with what Jesus would think. So some of these are from last week. Philippians 4, 8, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, and then the warnings in Scripture about not choosing, I love the word fleshly. Doesn't that sound no, lascivious? Um, all those like Jane Austen words Um, but just those fleshly human worldly thoughts Um, the Bible says "Uh uh-uh don't do that don't think you're going to be tempted to think that way it's going to seem smart it's going to seem right but it's not my way so some of the verses that that warn us about that and again I've just pulled out two or three for each of these Romans 121 and Romans 8 7 that warn us about don't think like the world. Compare it with the truth. Compare it with what I've told you. Not I, Catherine. I, God. Um, so, we've gone through those questions. Thought spirals. I'm going to get to that because they're going to ring the bell here in just a minute. So, I've done an illustration of one. You don't have to write it down, but I encourage you this week to see if you can map out what connects. Um, so, one of the one of the thought patterns Let's do the downward spiral first. Let's start with the negative so we can end on the upward note. Um, so on the downward spiral, this is the one we don't want, if that wasn't clear. Um, you know, because we don't, when I was a kid, we go, you don't want to go down there. Um, but I don't think we tell us really down there, but for some reason we always act like it was. So the downward spiral is not what we want. So the emotion that I chose for my example here is that woe is me self-pity, what Paul could could have easily been thinking. Um, and so what would that thought be that would come from, oh, this is awful, everything is horrible for me. What could follow that? Do you have any control? I'm a victim, I'm helpless. That might become the next thought. I have no control here. This is just happening to me. It is what it is. Um, And I'm sure some people really love that statement, it is what it is. I don't when it means I'm just giving up, I'm just giving over to it, I'm a victim to this. Um, And so what behaviors might come from if you're thinking, I'm a victim, I can't change it, everything's awful. How might you act, what might your actions look like? Post something you regret on Facebook. (laughs) <laughs> well, I'm just going to say it. <laughs> just say it. <laughs> so, that's why I love it. Overeat. Overeat. Mm-hmm. Say something you don't mean to, maybe in a public setting. Complain. Mm-hmm. Just, or again, I'll pull out another Alabama phrase, but I don't think it's just Alabama. Nye, nye. Just <laughs> kind of. <laughs> my mom would always be like, don't get involved in the nye, nye. But it was just like, don't sit and stew and complain all the time. And so then how does that impact your relationships? It hurts them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What did you say? Take it out on others. Yeah. Blame it on them. Just not a fun person to be around. Um, and then that's just going to lead you to consistently being unhappy, hard to please, negative. Okay, I'm getting really depressed. So <laughs> let's flip it because now we don't, that's not what we want. And that's not what Jesus teaches us. That's, it's very easy, I think, in the church too, sometimes it's really easy to start thinking about getting so down on the world. Everything is awful. We're all, everything's just horrible. And we walk around very somber. And that's not what the Bible teaches us. Yes, it teaches us to point out evil and to avoid it. But it also is a whole lot of good news about what's coming next and hope. 
So let's talk about how the thought pattern can be interrupted if we remember, okay, we get to choose how we think, and if we're choosing the mind of Christ, how that impacts the spiral. Um, so again, let's go from the bottom up. If we insert that same feeling, that emotion at the bottom, that is, um, and I just realized I made a typo. This is why you should not do things in haste. Um, <laughs> even though I did this early in the week, I didn't have anybody look at it. On the downward spiral, it really, at the very bottom, should have consequence, not emotion. So if you just want to scratch that out and do the old-fashioned editing, um, that would be great. So I have a choice. It's really just it completely flipped. And that's what we're trying to remind ourselves we can do. We can flip our thought patterns away from the worldly. Uh, everything's awful. That's not what the Bible teaches us. So if we start at the bottom, talk over these kids. Probably not kids. Um, I think we start out with the emotion of self-pity, woe is me. Um, instead of, I have, I'm a victim, if that arrow, I have a choice, or whatever mantra helps you remember. For me, it is, wait a minute, you have a choice how you're thinking here, Catherine. Or if you go, wait, what, what would the mind of Christ look like? Maybe. What would the mind of Christ look like? Then what did Paul flip his circumstances to? What, did he, what was he thinking about his circumstances? In Philippians 1, when he was in the jail. He was thankful. Yeah, he saw it as an opportunity mm -hmm. to show others, this is how a Christian lives, or I get to preach to these people who are here in the jail too. So that thought switches from trying, trying to change our circumstances necessarily to how can I use my circumstances to advance the gospel or to share, um, to glorify God where I find myself. So then your behavior, Denise, you kind of said it. You're, you're going to be giving thanks. Yeah, you're going to be giving thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's making a list. Maybe it's pointing it out. I did that walking out of work today with a coworker. We both felt like we had spun our wheels all day reacting to things. I'm like, did we even get anything done? And as we were walking out to the car, I said, okay, we are going to make a list, even if it's just two things of something we at least made progress on or somebody that we helped, even if it seemed very tiny. And it was much better <laughs> just to make, but we had to make ourselves do that. Um, so then what does that do to our relationships? When we're not trying to complain about our circumstances, we're looking for ways to help, help us advance the gospel and glorify God wherever we are, and we're looking for things to be grateful for. What does that make relationships like? people want to be around you. Encourage you're an encourager. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're like a magnet. You're encouraging. And of course, I want to be around encouraging people. Um, and so the consequence there, consequences are not always negative. You're probably going to be more joyful. You're definitely going to be less negative. Um, and that is the type. So that's just how things can stack upon themselves. But it was on, the only difference there, the emotion that started both of those out was the same. So try to think through those this week. Again, among your other million things to do. But again, what do we say? You only have one job as Christians. You have one job. Take a minute. Think about your thought patterns. Try to capture just one of your thoughts. And that was one of the um, questions, challenges on that sheet was think of one thought this week. Just one thought, not even a pattern that you can tell is not healthy, not true, um, put it down, and then find a piece of truth to replace it with, because your mind's not a vacuum. It needs something in there to fill the space. Um, and then come back next week to hear Kathy. Is that everything? Any more wrap up I forgot, Diane? All right, thank you everybody. Thank you.